good morning to all of you and particularly to chaitra and kirti who have said good morning even before the program uh, started off i have a very nice uh, short video i wish i could have shown it to you all uh, it talks about the eagle you know the eagle uh, puts up its nest on a cliff high above 500 feet 1000 feet above the level if there is a huge cliff you know it finds a niche there and it builds a nest and it lays the eggs and the eggs hatch and those little tiny eaglets come out the eagle goes roaming around finds food brings it and keeps uh, giving it to the uh, uh, babies and the babies slowly start getting more and more uh, you know, healthier and bigger and all one fine day the mother eagle comes to the nest and has a nice strong and deep look at the kids and you know what she does one by one she starts kicking them out of the nest and the nest is 1000 feet above the ground and this kid the eaglet who has spent her entire little life happily snuggled in the nest suddenly finds herself in the open air dropping down instinctively you know what she does the eaglet she spreads out her wings and the descent slows down and then she starts flapping her wings and she starts moving and before you know it the eaglet is flying away to look and create her own life this is reality compare that with human beings what do we do with our children i'll give you a very interesting uh, example you know once upon a time we used to have schools and we used to have school buses and all that do you remember that good old uh, era okay this is a story from that era the school buses go around picking up the children and bringing them to school let's say the bus the school starts at 8:30 so the bus is supposed to reach at 8:15 8:20 something like that 8 o'clock there's a call to the school office uh i want to know whether my son has reached he is coming in that uh, bus number 7 no ma'am buses come only by about 8:15 8:20 it's too early it has not come okay 5 minute later she calls up again i want to know whether my son so and so has reached uh, or uh, not he is coming in bus number 7 no ma'am it's just 8:5 uh, 8:10 there is still time for the bus to Uh, come they'll come don't worry 8:14 she calls up third time i want to know whether my son has reached safely or not he should be coming any minute now ma'am but you're getting so worried which class is your son the office person think that maybe the son is a very tiny fellow so the mother is getting very scared no which class is your son and the mother says no 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 he is the bus driver i wanted to know whether he has reached school safely or not sound like a joke it isn't there are innumerable parents who just cannot let go one of the usual uh, stories and jokes that keep circulating all over the place no saas bhi kabhi bahu thi and all those why is there a continuous tussle between the so called mother in law and the daughter in law very rarely between son in law and son in law much more prevalent is son in law and daughter in law why because here is this mother who gives birth 9 months in her womb she carries the fetus with great difficulty she has her delivery and here is this wonderful bundle of joy so often when i ask people particularly ladies tell me the happiest moment in your life they talk about few things some of them say when i got distinction in my studies some of them say something else once in a while they say the day i got married also but you will be amazed at the number of people who say the day i saw my baby for the first time when i gave birth to my baby to innumerable women that is the happiest day of their life wonderful and then the baby start growing up 
particularly if it happens to be a boy baby. And she showers all her love and affection. And if by chance, during those days, the husband has become very busy, he is neglecting her, he is just not available, or they are having a not very pleasant time together, the mother's focus goes entirely on to the son. And the mother wants to relive her life through the son and starts giving the best of everything to the son. All attention, all love, all caring, all upbringing, academic. She will sit for hours together to see that the child does his homework. All that is done and the fellow grows up. And more because of the effort of the mother than the effort of himself, he manages to land himself in a good college from where he graduates out with good marks. And then he gets a good job. Then he starts building up his career. And one fine day, the mother herself selects a bride for the uh, uh, son and says, why don't you marry this girl? And the obedient son says, yes, I will do it. And this fellow gets married. And then the tussle starts. Mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. The funny thing is that same mother-in-law has a daughter. Maybe around the same age as the daughter-in-law. And the relationship between the mother and daughter is excellent. You ask the daughter and she will say, my mother is the sweetest and best human being in the whole world. And you ask the daughter-in-law, she has a completely different version. Haven't you seen this left, right and center in so many households? Why do you think that uh, happens? Because of this indoctrination and of this inability to let go. The son is already 25, 30, 35, 40, whatever may be the age. But somewhere the umbilical cord has still not been broken. In all her good intentions, in all her love and affection, in all the great sacrifices she has made of her own life and of her own career for the sake of the uh, son, she does not know that she is still hanging on to the son and doing a disservice to him. That is the reason why I thought I pulled up this topic today to talk not only about autonomy in uh, children who are growing up, but autonomy in adult children also. I'll give you a real life example. There was this gentleman who was 50 plus who came to me for counseling saying that I'm never happy with whatever I'm doing in life. I have a good job. I have been progressing well in my career. I have a good wife. We share a very good equation. I have good children. They are studying well and they are coming up very, very well and making a good future for themselves. I have good health. I have good relationships with everybody around, but I am not happy. There's something, you know, that craving is there in me that I should do a little more. I should be better. I should try this. I should do that. It's perpetually there, he said. Right? Like I do in most such cases, I made him talk right from his childhood. And then he told me that he lost his father when he was very small. And he and his brother, who is just about a year older than him, both of them were brought up by their mother. The mother sacrificed her entire life for the sake of these two boys. She struggled. She did all sorts of things and brought them up. And the elder brother happens to be an achiever. So intentionally or without realizing it, whenever the mother would talk to this person, my counselee, she would say, see what your brother is doing and see what you are doing. Any achievement of his, and she would compare to the elder son and say, yeah, yeah, good, I'm happy you have done this. But see, your brother has done so much more. No, why can't you do that? This poor fellow, right from his childhood till 50 years of age, was left with that feeling that I am not good enough. I should struggle more. I should achieve more. I should do this. I should do that. After waiting for 20 years, he built his dream house. He had bought a plot long back and kept it. And then he decided to build that house. And he wanted to make sure that there is all comforts for his mother. The mother was prime focus. Despite the fact that he's got wife, children, 
he was least bothered about their needs. He was more bothered about the mother's needs. And he saw to it that the entire house was designed so that it is comfortable for the mother. And when the house was ready and they were celebrating the Graha Pravesh, the mother looks around and, these, and then says, your brother's house is much better than this. Finished. Poof. In one minute, all his joy of achievement of building and all his efforts to please his mother are also gone. These are some of the things. Of course, these are extreme cases. But I just wanted to caution you how, without realizing it, we don't let go of our children. We keep sort of, you know, pulling them, pushing them all the time saying that, I have to take care of my child. My child is not capable of taking care of himself or herself. And the more we think that way, obviously, the less are the chance that he will ever become capable of. One classic area in which I have been struggling to try and create more and more awareness is the area of career selection. So many parents come to me and say, yeah, he's a very good student. He may be even a topper. He studies very hard. He gets excellent marks. But he is not mature enough. He is not capable of taking his decision. So whether he should take science or commerce or PCMB or PCMC, whether he should go to PUC or CBSC, whether he should uh, take coaching for JEE and all these things, I will decide on his behalf. He is not capable of deciding. What an anomaly. I am not teaching the child how to be autonomous, how to think for himself, how to start planning his career. And then I condemn the child saying that he is not capable. It is like I take my child to the tennis club and then say, no, 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 he is not capable of playing tennis. So I will play on his behalf. You sit here and watch me playing. Because he doesn't know how to play tennis. No. Obviously, he doesn't know because you haven't taught him such simple things in something as important as career selection. Ten years the child studies from first to tenth standard. Two more years in plus two. And nowhere is there a subject or an orientation or a help to understand what is a career. He is good in maths and physics, let him become an engineer. He is good in biology, let him become a doctor. Being good in biology is only 10% of the requirement of being a good doctor. There are 90% other factors which have not been taken into account. That is how I want us to understand that we need to work in this direction. Long, long ago, from uh, our IIT campus in Pawai, we used to go cycling outside the city. There was a small ashram where there was a highly educated young Swamiji who used to be running that ashram. And he used to welcome us. He used to say, come, even if you want to come on a weekend and sleep over, have, you know, stay here overnight or something. He used to welcome us. And he used to speak a lot of sense. He was a highly qualified person himself. And he had uh, taken sannyas and uh, set up that ashram. One day he told us uh, something like a parable, you know. He says, uh, you know, once upon a time in an orphanage like ours, somebody left a very small baby on the doorstep and disappeared. So we took him in. Baby was you know, very vulnerable. We took the baby in and we started feeding the baby, cleaning, taking care of the baby. Within a few days, we realized that this baby is completely crippled. He cannot move his hands and legs. He cannot feed himself. He cannot do any basic needs of his own. And as he grew up, he couldn't speak. He couldn't understand language. So what they did was that they just kept him in a corner and took turns to clean him up and feed him and take care of uh, him on, on compassionate grounds. One day it so happened that a very rich person was coming there. They come there to orphanages not to appease their own conscience, distributing sweets and shirts to children or something there. One such person came there. And when he was giving out these sweets, he went to this fellow lying in the ground and started offering the sweets saying, take, take. 
and that child is just staring at him lying down, not lifting his hand to take the seat. He said, why he doesn't like sweets, is it? He is not taking. They said, no, he's not capable of lifting his hand and eating. You give me that sweet, I will have to feed him. <coughs> said he's already growing up and he is flat on bed and he can't do anything. No, he can't do anything. That man was very touched. He went and contacted a hospital or a doctor whom he knew very well and said, bring him for assessment and uh, investigation. Those doctors did a lot of investigation and said, we will have to make him go through a lot of treatment, some surgery, some physiotherapy, some this thing, that thing. But we can make him normal or we can make him do the regular things which a growing child should do. And that's what rich man said, I will sponsor it. So this child was taken continuously from the orphanage, regular treatment, surgeries, physiotherapies, speech therapy, whatever is required, they did that for years. And finally, that boy got up. He could move his hands and legs. He could walk. He could eat by himself. He even started catching up on the education which he had uh, missed out. And he grew up. Now, Swamiji, who was telling us this story, no? he stopped there and he said, this young man is now 30 years old. Make a wild guess what he must be doing now. He said, Swamiji, how do we know? No, no, make a guess. So somebody said, no, he must have become a doctor and he must be taking care of other patients because of what he went through. Somebody said, maybe he has taken sannyas and he's uh, running some ashram or working there. Somebody said, no, he must have gone and taken up some regular job and he must be leading his life and marriage or something like that. After we had all finished, Swamiji said, he is now locked up in central jail, life sentence for committing a murder. What? Yes, we pampered him so much, the rich man pampered him so much, the doctors pampered him so much, that as he got up and as he started becoming functional and as he started moving around, he started thinking that the world starts and stops with me. He became very selfish, he became greedy, he became, you know, cruel to the other people around him. Slowly, he became an antisocial, he started indulging in crime. One fine day, he committed a murder and now he is locked up in jail. Now, in the jail, whether he is flat on bed or whether he can walk and talk makes no difference. All this effort has gone a waste. And... Moral of this story, Swamiji said, we taught that boy how to walk. We did not show him the direction where to walk. That's it. There's no point in giving an education to your child. There's no point in sending him for coaching and this and that and ensuring that he passes. Today, results of CBSC 12th standard has come. Barring some one odd child here and there who may have been absolutely pathetic or not interested, everybody has passed. So here we have, you know, 100%, 99.9% of children. All you had to do was to go and sit uh, for whatever the exams were held and you have passed. Is this what we want our children to be? On the other hand, how many of these children are able to face life squarely? How many of them have good emotional intelligence? Are we teaching all this? And if we teach a basic thing like emotional intelligence, for example, or life skills, we are empowering the child, remember, to take his own decisions, to lead a balanced life. Not to develop that herd mentality where you just keep on following. Everybody says computer science, so I am doing that. Everybody says IIT, so I am chasing IIT. Everybody says something like that. This is the need of the hour more so now than it was earlier. And that is what we need to understand. The child is today. You cannot wait for the lockdown to be over, for the pandemic to be over, for the schools to reopen and then say, OK, we will catch up. Nobody can catch up on the growing years of your life. 
if you are 30 or 60 years old and if you want to take a sabbatical in life for any reason i've had friends for example who had a major accident and had to be on bed for months together but when they got you know cured and when they got up yes they had to undergo physiotherapy they were unstable they had to relearn a lot of things but they've gone back to normal life that does not happen with children with children you have to pay attention to them today and as the old proverb goes instead of feeding a fish to a man hungry man teach him how to do fishing instead of going on giving all possible inputs to your child and doing spoon feeding and taking care of all his needs please teach him how to take care not only of his own needs but also of his wants this is a very crucial thing i want you to understand many children who have had all their needs taken care of they still go off track they lose focus their motivation goes uh, uh, down they seem to be getting distracted from what they should be doing and get into activities which they should not be doing why does that happen because we must learn to understand that there are needs and there are wants needs are essential every human being needs food clothing shelter whatever those are needs and almost all of us more so we the educated sector or middle class whatever we want to call ourselves we always fulfill the needs of our children no? We will never allow our child to starve or we will never allow our child not to have proper food or shelter or whatever. Everything we take care of. But remember that the child also has wants. So if the child says, I want to have this, this, this. I want to play in the field for some time. I want to be with friends without mommy or daddy snooping on me. It is not a need, but it is a very strong want. If you fulfill the wants of children and then hold them responsible by saying, OK, I am allowing you to do this. You want to do cycling? OK, I will get you a cycle. I will teach you and you start going around on the cycle. You want to use the mobile? OK, I will help you. I'll get you a mobile. I'll teach you how to operate the mobile like that. One by one, one by one, whatever this thing is, but we have to parallelly make the child understand the responsibility factor. There can be no autonomy, no freedom without responsibility. Countries who gained independence within few years were back into slavery by a dictator. Why? Because they were given independence. They were not taught responsibility. At our own level, within our own family, we can do this. Start with making the child involved in everything possible. In the Western countries, every child is taught to do what they call as chores. You have to wash dishes, you have to mow the lawn, you have to do this, you have to do that. Here, if we are well to do and we can afford it, we consider it below our dignity to tell our child even to wash his underwear. We do not tell the child or teach the child that he should wash his own plate after eating and keeping it, keep it in the proper uh, uh, place. If we do not do that, how do you expect the child to develop that autonomy, which not only creates the skills and the ability to do what he wants to or what he needs to do, but also that sense of responsibility. In our society, we also have this very funny concept of the white collar workers and the blue collar workers. We are all white collar workers. Every one of us wants to be sitting in an office or an air conditioned room and working on our laptops. Nobody wants to work with their hands. 
this is another area as your child is growing up please teach your child how to do physical work away from the screens and gadgets and apps every possible physical work should be taught to the child to wind up this uh, you know first half of uh, the program as you know we uh, have a very lively and a very open uh, question answer debate in the second half so for the first half let me uh, you know give you very simple six tips which go towards increasing the autonomy increasing the responsibility increasing the independence of the child the first one is what i have always been talking about however small your child is make him have choices give him choices we are making this roti or this rice what do you prefer to eat we are going to the park do you want to go to this park or that park you have to change your dress and put on a new t-shirt do you want to wear the blue t-shirt or the green t-shirt start with simple things like that and at every stage help the child to take choices <clears throat> then the child will grow up knowing how to make choices about his career about his life partner about his way of living all that the foundation is on this number 1 make the child give the child opportunity to make choices and to take his own decisions number 2 show respect for his struggle when a small child starts doing something and he fails always appreciate his efforts i'm so happy that you tried a simple thing the child may be wanting to open a bottle of jam or something like that and he is struggling and he cannot do it don't take that away from him saying that no no you are too small you can't do it let me open it and give you i'm so happy that you took the trouble of trying to open today you didn't succeed it's okay i will help you and open the bottle for you but this effort if you continue you will be able to do a lot of things in the coming days and years so show respect for his struggle third one don't ask too many questions to children the moment they feel that we are being questioned on anything and everything what did you do in the free period where did you go out with who are your uh, friends when you took that cycle which road and which lane did you go into don't do uh, that on the other uh, um, hand point number 4 do not rush to answer questions many a time children keep asking question they are only rhetoric ya ke ma why this has to be done this way yeah i was also wondering why it has to be done let's find out right now i'm busy cooking you also think over it don't feel compelled that you have to give answers to every question put the ball back in their court and help them to find the answers and show that interest yes i am also interested in exploring this and finding out uh, this number 5 encourage the child to use outside sources i can't answer this question but you know that uh, rao uncle is there he is very experienced in this 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 why don't you call him up and ask him maybe he will be able to tell you why don't you google this and check out and then let me know then together we will do this discussion and find out more about uh, this why don't you ask your cousin who is senior to you how he managed in this uh, when he was in your class what did he do and those sort of uh, things and sixth never take away hope from the child you you are good for nothing i don't know what you will do i don't know what you are doing after that the child refuses to even make efforts to take up responsibility or do things which he is supposed to do so i'll quickly repeat the six of them number 1 help him and encourage him to make choices number 2 show respect for his struggle number 3 don't ask too many questions number 4 don't rush to answer questions make it a joint effort number 5 encourage him to use outside sources and number 6 don't take away hope that in a gist is what we can do to encourage autonomy in children actually sima has a message on how you can further take uh, the children into the level of autonomy let her tell you that and you know no that i need this 2 minute break i'll be back
Hey everyone. So uh, Ali has been giving some wonderful tips. And as you know, we are also uh, we are a counseling center. And from time to time, many people come and discuss a lot of uh, issues. How do I look after my children? How do I, you know, uh, make sure uh, I uh, help them with decision making? What is good for them? What is good for me? So based on that, we keep uh, planning out a lot of uh, programs, uh, short duration, long duration, uh, you know. So, uh, of course, our flagship program, DCS, is on Diploma in Counseling Skills. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a journey where you start from looking within, um, of, you know, your close-knit family, friends, relationships, and how to be a professional counselor, how to reach out to the society in large. So that is our flagship program and the admissions are on and uh, classes have started, right? So that is one. And um, uh, also from uh, time to time, the uh, upskilling, uh, doing a lot of programs. So this one, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, this is for our DCS students who have already completed DCS. We are in the 23rd year. So last 22 years, uh, people have done. They want to move to the next, uh, uh, you know, they, they are stuck sometimes in their counseling sessions with a few things. So these kind of uh, therapies and tools also help uh, one to move forward, right? And uh, coming to uh, a, a wonderful program called Youngs. It has been a super successful program. Our team is very, very enthusiastic. And children, we were very surprised. We were wondering if normally we've never done this program online. But uh, this time, the response has been huge. And all those pointers which Ali was giving you about uh, you know developing life skills in uh, children, this is the program for them. This is meant for uh, children uh, up to 18 years of age and uh, how we can help them to develop their life skills. So it's a wonderful program. Please get in touch with us and we'll give you more information. Uh, another wonderful program coming up is a parenting workshop. This is conducted uh, by uh, Nalini uh, Raja Reddy, who's been a very, very experienced. She's our director and a very experienced, uh, uh, you know, a counselor, a faculty, trainer. So uh, Nalini and her team are conducting this workshop on effective uh, parenting. It will again be full of mentoring programs and all of that. It's for one month, the whole of August. And uh, uh, if as a parent or any significant adult, you know, you want to work on uh, children to develop their life skills and also a lot of work on yourself as well as a parent. So again, please get in touch and uh, we would love to give you, uh, you know, information about all these courses. So with this, I hand you over back to Dr. Ali. My tea is not yet over, but I don't want to keep you waiting. Yes. So I'm now, I've received a lot of good mornings and all these um, lot of words of praise. And I thank you all for uh, all the, you know, compliments and praises that you have given. And now let's move on more towards the uh, dialogue and questions. Noor Sabas has a classic example of increasing the autonomy of a child is the story of Helen Keller, born blind and deaf. But her teacher, Anne Sullivan, never was sympathetic. Instead, taught her how to learn words and understand things around her. That's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Glad you brought that up, Noor. By sympathizing with a child, we are disabling the child. Pity, compassion. Ayo, Papa. It's like treating your child as a beggar. But by empathizing. How Anne Sullivan could empathize with a little girl who could neither speak nor see. Just visualize for a moment a world where you cannot you know, just uh, understand. Do you think such a child would grow up to become anything productive member of society? And yet we know what Helen Keller uh, did. It was amazing, her achievements. And like that, 
there are a lot of potential Helen Kellers all around us, children who can grow up into something. But the final thing that remains is to allow the child to blossom in the direction that the child is good at and the child wants to do. You cannot plant an apple seed and as the plant grows up, you cannot say there is no scope nowadays in apples, but the scope for mangoes is very high. So I will give you fertilizer. I will send you for mango coaching. I will do all that. But when you grow up, you have to give me mangoes and not apples. It never works that way, right? The same thing applies to children. Okay, Vidya says, how do we talk to children to listen? Some children go on to do what they want. Very simple, very easy, Vidya. We do not teach them how to listen. We start listening. For some time, go on and on and on, encouraging the child to talk. Say one or two sentences, raise up a particular topic. This is what has happened recently. We were having rains, now the rains have stopped. So what do you think we can do? Schools are, were to reopen, but then I think there is going to be a delay by a few more weeks. What are we going to raise up a topic and make the child talk? And most important, when the child is talking, probe into his emotion. That is empathy. What do you feel about online classes? What do you feel about the fact that again, reopening of the schools has been postponed? What do you feel about the fact that I, as a parent, feel that even if schools reopen, I'm not going to send you to school till you are fully vaccinated, which we don't know when it is going to happen. What do you feel about it? As a parent, you have a right to dictate certain things. If you feel you don't want to send your child to school, you have a right. But take the feelings of the child. Encourage. The more you listen to the child, the more the child learns what is listening, appreciates. And tomorrow, when you have something to say, the child uh, you know, starts listening to uh, uh, you. Nita says it's actually very alarming to see some of the families who are actually very well educated or in good positions, but are actually very blind towards their children, especially their sons. And we can see it very clearly, but very challenging to tell them, give any suggestion. Yes, but we can keep doing our little bit gently, very subtly, keep bringing this point into the uh, no, topic of conversation without any accusation, without pointing out or you know, telling them what is right or uh, uh, wrong. That is how we need to keep working on uh, with uh, um, children, that we need to, you know, help them. That's also part of the main topic that is developing the autonomy. Let the child develop that autonomy, that desire, that ability to listen. Don't trust listening to the child. Again, I go back to the great psychologist, Dennis the Menace. He's turning around and telling his mother, why is it that when you say we need to talk, it is only you who is doing the talking. Classic example of how many of us as elders, parents, teachers, whatever role we are playing in life, how we do not understand the basic nuances of the fact that children have so much to teach us. Children have a need to be encouraged to go on and on and on exploring the world and finding out for themselves, including sometimes falling down and restarting all over uh, uh, again. Some kids are so addicted to mobile game in spite of telling pros and cons of wasting time in front of the game. Kids land up playing how to manage such a situation. The more you keep telling pros and cons, the more you keep using words like you are wasting time in front of game or anything, you know, those sort of things, the more they will get resistant. They will come to a point where they will be looking at you and their mind will be somewhere far away. Please remember that there is a vital difference between hearing and listening. Your child has no option but to hear when you are talking and that too when we start talking so loudly to the child and scolding him. 
the child cannot put cotton in his ears, it doesn't help. So what we need to do is to explore, find a question, find out what do you like to do? Give him choices. I started off by saying give him choices. If not playing games on the mobile, what other alternatives? Something interesting. No, no, go and do your studies. That's not an option. That's not a um, choice. Okay, Anna says it is because we are more educated than the older generation that we are not giving autonomy to kids. Very true. I remember as kids, we were given choice to do what we want. Yet when we want to let child decide on something, we feel they are not capable of it. Is it because kids are digital natives? No, it is nothing to do with the kids. It's to do with us, as you yourself said very rightly in us, that we seem to think I am educated. I am working in the uh, big world out there. I know so many things. So therefore, I know how to be a parent. But you have never qualified yourself as a parent. That's why we are doing a parenting workshop. Does parenting have to be taught? Yes, it has to be uh, uh, taught. Okay, Nursava says teaching our kids develop a sense of independence is a crucial life skill which has to be inculcated as early as possible. That's why the other program that we do is on life skills. See, we are doing our little bit which is a drop in the ocean. I'm not saying that every one of you has to register for our courses and learn from us. There are 100 different sources from where we can learn. There are so many ways in which you can teach us. We are very open to that. But altogether, as a team of adults, I told you, no, whether we are parents, teachers, counselors, whatever we are, can we take this trouble and can we take this initiative to understand what are the do's and don'ts, what are the needs and wants of the 21st century child and adapt ourselves to do it. Ah, Navina says, if my child behaves in a manner which I do not like, I pause for a while and then try to encourage my child to speak as to why he is behaving. Hats off to Navina and so many other mothers like her. If you can learn to do that, just pause for a while. The child's emotions are high. Your emotions are high. You will only end up in a bickering match. You as an adult should have that resilience, that patience to back off. Pause for a while. Say, wait, let me finish this work and then get back to you. Or let me take some time. Let, sometimes it's okay to be you know, truthful also. I think I'm getting a little emotional on this thing. I don't want to lose my temper or raise my voice. So I think I, I need a break. I think I'll sit and watch some nice program or I'll listen to music. And then we'll continue with our uh, discussion. And then when you start the discussion, as Navina rightly said, encourage the child to speak as to why he is behaving. The why is the empathy factor. Okay, you said that you want to do this or you already behaved in this uh, manner, which I don't like. That's my opinion and that's your opinion. Fine. Before I start passing judgment or before I get angry with you or you know force you into something, I would like to hear from you why you prefer this particular behavior. What do you think is the advantage? Vidya says, how do we deal uh, with teenage children who are not serious despite having strengths but don't realize what they are going to miss out if they get defocused? I come back to the point that I told earlier, uh, Vidya, that are we providing them with career guidance? Are we providing them with directions and goals? Are we telling them what are the options open to them? Are we willing to listen to them if tomorrow your child says, I don't want to be an engineer, doctor, lawyer, all these stupid things. I only want to be a Formula One car racing driver. What is your response? My response would be, hey, there's a career called Formula One car racing driver, is it? Tell me more about it. Immediately the child is disarmed. And some children know a lot. He may make money as a car racing driver or whatever he wants to do, we don't know. On the other hand, if that was just a craze, just a instinctive thing, you say, yeah, you know, that one, uh, that uh, some Michael Schumacher was there and something else is there and all that. No, that's not enough. No, why don't you find out more? When you find out more and come back, more, then we'll discuss that as an option. But in the meanwhile, since you don't seem to know much about it, 
let us now talk about what happens if you become a software engineer or a lawyer or an architect or whatever I've been talking to you uh, about. Uh, it's amazing how children teach us a lot too. Their perspective is so original and sadly we dumb it down. Absolutely, Tina, 100% I agree with uh, uh, you that we are forgetting that today's children, this, you know, the digital natives and all, they can teach us so much. Why are we closing our minds? Why have we decided that I know everything and my child doesn't know anything? It's not fair on the child. It is not even fair to yourself because you are losing out on an opportunity to learn so many things by keeping your mind completely um, closed. I mentioned this earlier, but I'm repeating again. This young teenager, when in a seminar he was asked, you know, why is it that you don't give respect to your elders? He smiled and he said, I don't see why I should give respect to somebody just because incidentally he was born before me. There's your answer. Just because somebody is older chronologically does not mean that you are more capable or wiser. In fact, in today's world, where change is coming in so rapidly, it is a disadvantage to have been born earlier. We are outdated in so many ways. Whatever you have learned when you were a child, it's been completely negated. Now everything has become new. Why don't we accept that? Why is it that we are still clinging on to the older uh, things? Noor says we have to show our kids the pros and cons of any situation and then motivate them for decision. Yes, Noor. I will also add one more step to it. When you are showing your child the pros and cons, encourage him to find out more pros or cons. Be open. This is what I know about car racing. This is what I know about a career in sports. This is what I know about what happens if you take humanities instead of science or uh, commerce. Now, can you add to that, please? Can you list out what are the other pros and cons which I missed out on? Can you talk it over with your friends, make a group and do some investigation, find out things and get back uh, uh, to me? I would be, like to take it from there. It makes a world's difference. We have to keep on practicing this uh, um, thing. Yes, I agree that, uh, you know, um, the. <laughs> Uh, it was a very apt question by the youngster. Navina says that I learned from my son how to laugh in a difficult situation and make it light. I learned from him the beautiful interpersonal skills he has, although he is just 12. And I think you are all aware, I'm repeating again, being able to laugh at yourself is what we define as sense of humor. And sense of humor is a very, very strong parameter or pillar about mental health. If you have good sense of humor, which primarily is the capacity to laugh at yourself, not to take yourself too seriously, to be able to smile and get corrected if somebody points out your mistakes. It shows your mental health is good and that reflects on the child. If I keep doing that, automatically my child learns the same um, thing. Anna says it is not my child does not know anything. It's like when I speak to my 11 year old son, he knows way more than me. And he learns from different various platforms, whereas we did not have as much as we have now. Exactly, Anna, that's what I'm telling. That your children have that ability, the resources, the you know, high curiosity levels if you encourage them by making, creating more and more autonomy in them. The moment we start telling a child, this is not in the portion, this is not in the syllabus, don't question unnecessarily, don't ask stupid questions. We are killing the curiosity and the exploratory nature and the desire to learn and de facto, 
we are taking away the autonomy of the child. The child loses interest in trying to explore and find out what has to be done and what decisions he has to uh, take and how he would like to take his life forward. If we start off with that, I told you in the beginning, I'm repeating again, start with very small children. Start with toddlers. There are two toys. Ask the child, which toy do you want? I don't know. You give me no. You have to select. It's your toy. You are going to play with it. I will get you whichever one you said. And when the child takes that one particular toy out of two, ask him later, why did you select that one? If he said, no, this was a red colored truck, so I liked it compared to the blue one. OK, good. You liked it because it was red color. Once you started playing with it, do you realize that the blue one moves faster than the red one and it makes a good noise and you could have enjoyed that uh, uh, more? See, you got attracted only by the color. Sometimes what appears to be may not be the same in reality, right? So you saw the color attracted uh, you and therefore you picked up the red truck. But you learned a lesson that the blue truck, though it doesn't look as attractive as the red truck, has certain features by which you could have enjoyed much more and you could have played with uh, it, isn't it? So next time the child is taking a decision, his ability starts improving. Many a time you will come across a situation where the child is making an obviously wrong choice. You are very sure that the child is going to fail. I would say still allow him to do it. Failures are the stepping stones to success. You must teach a child how to face and accept failure. A child who does not accept failure and just goes on and on and on, you know, it's success. He cannot handle so many challenges that are coming in life. Recently, I counseled a child who was a topper in his school throughout. From first standard to 12th standard, he was a topper in his school. And everybody was raving and ranting, parents, teachers, relatives. Because of his abilities, he got into one of the top institutions of the country. And there he realized that he is not even average. He is below average. Because obviously, out of lakhs and lakhs of uh, students, the few who got selected were super, super toppers. Okay. No harm. You are now in an excellent institution. And even if you know you are in the bottom half of the uh, class, you can work your way up. No, The child couldn't take it. He actually dropped out of a top-notch institution because of the emotional angle. I can't bear to be one of the lowest uh, in the class. I'm so used to praise and things. Those are is what we need to uh, do. Yes, Tina says, uh, it happens at school. At times, I was told my child was too inquisitive and has strong opinions. When I asked, why was it bad? Teacher said they are meant to learn what all they are asked to. My child asked, was she told she was wrong? That's what is wrong with the education system. And unfortunately, a few you know, teachers who are ignorant about what real learning is all about. But at least we as parents can counterbalance that by saying, it's OK, ma, if that teacher tells you, know, that you have to learn only from the portion, you do it. But after you come back, we will sit and explore what you wanted to uh, do. I will encourage you. You had this doubt about this question, which your teacher said, don't ask because it's not in the portion. Huh? We will sit. I will try and find the answer. If I don't know, we will both ask somebody else and we'll get the um, answer. Noor says kids are tech savvy. Existentialist intelligence and interpersonal intelligence are also important. Exactly. It's not just that they are also important. They are the basis, the crux of, you know, the success, happiness, fulfillment of today's generation of children will depend 80 percent at least on their emotional intelligence, self-awareness, management of emotions, motivation, keeping yourself going positive affirmative. 
empathy, understanding why the other person did or say that rather than what he said. And finally, social skills. If your child grows up with the ability to get work done by others, he is going to be the top manager. Far more than any other technical or other academic skills that he is going to pick up. And that is the need of the hour. I have been watching this for years and decades. I have been seeing how important it is. I have seen people, what they were in childhood and in adolescence, and now they have completed their entire working life cycle and they have become senior citizens and they are now slowly retiring. I have been a keen observer of human behavior at every level. And I found that there are so much to learn. You also have friends, colleagues, neighbors. See their graph of life. Find out what happened in their growing up stage and how their parents dealt with them and what is the result. Check out other parents whom you know very well, what they are doing and what is the outcome of their behavior. Okay. Vidya says the other typical situation is where children feel they know it all because they have more access to information and have know-how of tools. What should we tell them to explain the importance of experience that elders carry, though they are not tech savvy? We need to balance both. In many ways today, experience has become a dirty word. You know that. Experience of doing things the way they were done 20 years or 40 years back is actually counterproductive because that doesn't apply. It is like saying, I from my childhood, I had experience of you know driving a bullock cart. My grandfather taught me. I know everything about how a bullock cart functions, what to do, how to tie the bullocks, how to feed them, how to control the bullock cart. I know everything. I'm so experienced. So come on, I'm going to be your transport advisor from now on. How does that sound? No, no. So that is what I'm saying. Of course, it is definitely not good what Vidya said that uh, children feel they know it all. No. If a child is coming to that level, then you have to nip it in the bud and say, Neither I know it all, nor you know it all. And even Google auntie doesn't know everything. Because there's a very nice proverb which says, Google can answer all your questions, but you need to know what are the correct questions to ask. Even that is a great skill. There are people who struggle with Google. Go on and on and on exploring and always lining up with the wrong answers because they haven't learned how to get the correct answers out from the internet. Even that is a skill. And that is a human skill. That is not something which you can learn by programming or becoming a software engineer. And those are the things which children need to learn. Children need to learn these basic life skills. And at the same time, to be able to be happy, satisfied in whatever they are uh, uh, doing. We do not have the time. This pandemic and lockdown has me very, very worried. Despite the fact that both my children have grown up and they are no longer you know, students or they no longer need inputs from me, they are more than happy. They can teach me a hundred things which I don't know. But I'm not going to be selfish and talk only about myself. I have so many friends who have growing children. So I come back to the final point that whether you are a parent, whether you are a grandparent, whether you are a teacher, whether you are a counselor, please understand that the needs and wants of today's children are different. We need to constantly encourage them to build autonomy, allow them to do what they want to do and to blossom out in the way they are going to blossom out. If you do that in your old age, you can sit down relax and have a very fulfilled life saying that whatever else I may have achieved, but I have brought up a good younger generation who are now taking over and they will ensure that the world will remain a good place while I walk into the sunset. So have a wonderful time. We shall meet again next Saturday at the same time, 11 o'clock. Bye bye.